the Father is our God. Yes, I'm so glad He's brought us all together. I'm so glad that the Father is our God. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we thank you for your mercies and your grace you've shown us through this week. Thank you for the Sabbath that you've given us to come to worship you and to be with our other fellow Christians. And Father, I pray that the unspoken request that's been lifted up to you, that you will answer them and, sh and show that you are the Almighty God. And Aaron's friend who's lost his eye, Father, I pray that you will show the physicians or a healing to the eyes that he may have sight again. And to the loved ones we've lost, Father, I pray that you would show them comfort and peace and, and give them a big hug to show them that you're nearby. And the uh, gentleman that was in the car accident, Father, I pray that you would help him heal and get over the accident and show him you're there with him to comfort him and you are the great physician. We ask, Father, that you just be with us through this, the rest of the service. Be with Michael as he delivers the sermon. May the Holy Spirit touch our hearts with the words for God. We thank you for all you've given us. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. You know, Monica, I was thinking about what you said and about how when we spend time with the Lord, it's this precious, beautiful moment. And as you were speaking about that, I, I thought, you know, there's some days where I, do, I work a lot or I'm gone on trips and I don't always get a lot of time with my kids every single day. I, sometimes I don't see them at all. But when I see them for that split second, in that moment, even when they're crying, like right now, I, when I have an opportunity to just look in their eyes and they just look at me and they say, Dad, I love you. No other words. It just breaks my heart. It just crushes me because I just love them so much. And it's, I almost reflect on God in the same way. It's like, you know, sometimes we don't even know the words to even speak or utter to the Lord, but sometimes he just needs an I love you. Because I would imagine God created me in his image, as he says, I would imagine he'd feel the same way. And so I just, uh, whenever we do spend time with him, just to find time, even if it's small. So thanks for that, Monica. That was beautiful. Um, let me pray for us as we uh, open up the word of God and as we just talk about uh, Sabbath in the wilderness together. Father God, Lord, so thankful for you. Lord, we're gathered here uh, in your name, Lord, together, Lord, professing to believe in you and to have alignment with you as we seek out your will for our lives. Lord, we are certainly not perfect and we fall short of your glory, but God, we ask and thank you for the forgiveness that you have given us on the cross, the sacrifice that you've made for each and every one of us. God, I just pray that you would continue to just work on our hearts, that you would bring us closer together as a family and that we would be even more efficient and effective, Lord, as we do your will uh, as a community of believers out into the world. Lord, thank you for the baptisms we learned about this morning, that we are excited to share in that blessing. And we pray for those lives, Lord, that they would um, draw close to you and they would not depart from you. Lord, we just uh, ask for the, the, the message this morning, God, that you would speak, Lord. I'm just a vessel. I'm, I am nothing. But God, I just lay these uh, words at your feet, God. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. <clears throat> so normally I like to have this all memorized, but I'm not so fortunate this morning, so I can just share it. But, um, but Sabbath in the wilderness, uh, just to talk about a high level, you know, man and I spend a lot of time in the outdoors. We have ever since we were young and as we first started our marriage. And it's something that's really been close to us, and it's been something we've really been able to grow 
together uh, while being in the outdoors. And uh, part of this message is to just share what is it like um, and what are the challenges that we've faced uh, along the way. So I would like to invite you on my journey to spending time with God and family on the Sabbath. My prayer is that you would not follow in my footsteps, but rather that you would allow my testimony to challenge your thinking of not only yourself, but how you support and encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ, as we all work to spend more time at the feet of Jesus. So this July, we'll make our 16th year of marriage. But when we were first starting out, the key ingredient in our relationship was discussing the Bible and hiking every weekend. Um, that is when I was home, when I was home from Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, during that season, I was gone uh, four and a half years. As we got older and began to have children, spending time outside became difficult and created conflict in the home. Feelings of being cooped up and looking at a messy house, which I think every parent feels that when you look around, you're like, I've got to get out of this house. I would imagine, actually, if, that's why the porch was invented, is because it was the one place where you could do a little bit of maintenance and anything dirty would get washed away in the rain. So it was like the perfect way to get out and pretend whatever was behind you didn't exist. And that's just me, I don't know. Um, so at times, that felt pretty overwhelming. But, but this mixed with working 70 hours a week left little time for family and helping out around the house. Even the Sabbath day ended up being where I wanted to sleep in the afternoons, lounge around the house, and when I sat down to read scripture, was surrounded by screaming little children. For us, this was a nightmare, and we knew we needed to mix it up. You know, even today, it, it can be a struggle for us a little bit. You know, we, when, we, uh, when I want to sit down and spend time on the Word, and there's so much commotion, it's hard. It's hard, and we've found the only time we get that is if I get up way before them, which usually is not possible with Evelyn, because she's knocking on the door like six, seven in the morning, or in the evenings, late at night when we're, we're tired. So it's a struggle, and I think, I don't know, if I, am I the only person that, that deals with that? No hands, okay, it's just me. <laughs> so, on our 14th anniversary a few years ago, Amin and I reflected on what was working great in our marriage and what we needed to improve. One of the surprising things was that we were tired of going out for dinner. When we had a date night, you know, that's really all we did. We just, the, the traditional quick thing to do is, hey, you want to grab dinner together? We just go out to dinner. And it seemed like the right thing to do for us. It just, hey, let's just go out. We'll spend time together. We'll talk. <clears throat> In that process, I realized I was missing a lot. And I didn't realize it. And for, this is my 14th year anniversary I'm talking about. For years, this has kind of been one of our go-to things for anniversary or for date nights. So instead, we really missed spending time doing simple things like rock climbing, backpack packing, floating the rivers, and spending time in God's word together. So we came up with a t-shirt and a game plan. And you've probably seen us wear the t-shirt around here and there and wondering, what in the world does that mean? Um, so the shirt says, act like you're broke, write a cute note, sing a song in her ear. We realize that we have much more fun when we don't spend money on our date nights, but instead do something creative. We also realized that we were missing writing notes to each other, which required time and thoughtfulness. And if you're a go, go, go person like I am, man, sitting down for a few minutes to write a note today. Back in high school, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a job. I could ride around. I could be cute all day long. But as I've gotten older, I seem to always be trying to compete with my 18-year-old self. I don't know if you guys ever feel that way, but I'll never, she'll never let me down and for how I was at one point in time. So I will. At least he was a young, cute guy, I guess. It's all good. So these things required time and thoughtfulness. And lastly, she missed hearing me play guitar often like the early years of our relationship. If we boil down the key activities that have helped us keep a strong relationship for, uh, from since we first met 18 years, it would be keeping Christ at the center of everything we do, spending time together, just the two of us, and taking a big breath 
out in God's creation is it had a way of rejuvenating our marriage and drawing us close to him. For some reason, being outside was, has been in our marriage the great healer. I can't explain it. But the more time we spend outside, there was always this, and, and for you guys, you know the smile on your wife. There's this smile like things are great, and there's this smile of pure joy. There's a difference, at least in my house. And when we're outside, I look at her face and I see this incredible joy-filled smile, like there's something else God is doing inside of her that, that I know I can't provide to her, but God's creation can. So today, spending time on the Sabbath comes with a twist. And a big question that I think I've had to entertain and, and think about for sure in my own walk and is it okay to miss church on the Sabbath? Um, and if you do miss church, what kind of activities make sense? I know for over the years, um, a typical work week for most Americans is usually from Monday through Friday, you're worn out, and Sunday you're working all day doing stuff in the garden or something. And the Sabbath is a time for what? It's always been a question for me. And, and again, I, I want to say what I said a minute ago. I'm not saying how you should live your life and where you are with the Lord and the Sabbath, but I just want to share my testimony and, and the kind of the journey that I've been along in these years. So growing up, I remember this being one of the most difficult questions to answer. In my childhood home, the answer was that we should never miss church for anything. That being said, we did miss church, sometimes for various reasons, sickness, travel, and sometimes sporting events that we were participating in through school. Even while my parents tried to be at church every week, it seemed to be an impossible task. No matter what we did, somehow we had to miss church for something, and this brought guilt and made us feel like we were failing our church family um, and failing God. We feel like, man, what are people going to think about us if we miss church this week? You know, people, every, every week we're always talking, everybody's talking about how you can't miss church, don't miss church. If you miss church, that's not good. And here we are missing church. So that was hard. It was hard to emotionally deal with the pressure and the tension on that. Over the years, I began asking myself a different question. If I'm unable to choose, if I'm unable or choose not to attend church on Sabbath, am I living in sin? See how that's a different question? Because really, it was, I learned it's not so much about what other people think of me, but where am I at with the Lord and I began to, to study, and I began to kind of research this. So to answer this question, the first word I needed to define was the word church. I guess I made that smaller than I needed. Uh, according to the Bible, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, if you're familiar with it, which means a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, a Jewish synagogue or a Christian community of members on earth saints in heaven, which that was interesting to me. Saints in heaven is considered a church, or, or therefore an assembly or a church where, where a, a group of people gather together in any fashion or form. Um, ultimately, I came to better understand that a church is not bound by four walls and a roof like we are used to, but the intentionality of coming together for religious reasons. Whether in heaven or on earth, now, I will say, I'm not confident that when we go to heaven, it's going to look like this church, nice church building we just built. It might look a little bit different. <clears throat> and I'm still pondering what, what that would look like for in heaven. We do know we have the kingdom that will come down, but what would church look like? I have no idea. I'm hoping I can fly at that time and I can be like outside or something really crazy. Um, what this meant for me is that while I was in Africa and watched people gather under the trees in buildings without roofs or Mali where we sat by the road or in Afghanistan where they met sometimes on mountaintops or valleys, homes or fields, that there was the intentionality of meeting together in the name of Jesus no matter the location or the activity. So for man and I, we have also taken refuge in a few key passages where we see what Jesus does on the Sabbath. 
And that's something I don't know about you guys. That's something I always end up doing. I'm like, okay, everybody's got this opinion. What's going on? What did, what's actually going on with Jesus? And like one of the biggest studies I ever did that really changed my, how I think is how Jesus talked to believers and how Jesus talked to non-believers, which opened my eyes more than I can express. But here's just a few things that Jesus did on the Sabbath as, as I'm trying to learn for myself. What did Jesus do? Well, in Matthew 12 is one of, the, one of the primary places where Jesus is defending the disciples and himself for actions that he's doing on the Sabbath. In his case, the church is giving him a hard time about what he's doing on the Sabbath, and, this, and Jesus is correcting them, essentially, in this case. The first thing, uh, disciples were walking, were out walking and picking grain on the Sabbath. They were out and about in the fields picking grain to eat. Matthew 12. King, King David who was during wartime, and he's fleeing for his life. So imagine they've got armor, their swords. In fact, actually just in the verse after that, he goes and gets the, the sword of Goliath from when he was a boy to take back out. So this is on the Sabbath. He's out picking up a weapon to go into war. But King David ate the consecrated bread on the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 3 through 4, and the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 9. Temple priests, according to Jesus, regularly desecrated the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 5. Jesus heals a man with weathered hand. Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, heals a man born blind, heals a crippled woman, heals a man with dropsy, drives out an evil spirit. Jesus heals a lame man at the pool of Bethsaida, or Bethesda, rather. This is just some of the verses. And lastly, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath, Mark 2, 27. And that's hard. It's hard to reflect on sometimes. I mean, um, because this is, this is a, a sensitive topic for us always. Um, but I would, I would say we probably would agree. It's, we're all trying to come in alignment with God's will and direction and be obedient, regardless of where we are in this journey. So Jesus responds to this topic, though, by sharing that, this is here in Mark 12, something greater than the temple is here. Now, in this case, and this is in Matthew 12, 6, regardless of our activities or location, I believe it is safe to say that the purpose of the Sabbath is to spend time at the feet of Jesus. And because the veil was torn, we have direct access to him anywhere. We're no longer having to go through someone or through a... Uh, the high priest who would be in the most holy place once a year. We now have any time in our home or anywhere direct access, and we have that blessing. So I kept, I kept reading this in, as I kept studying this topic, and I kept thinking, you know, were there any times that Jesus ever missed the Sabbath, and what did he do when he did that? And I came across Jesus in the wilderness. You remember the story where in Luke 4, 4, 1 through 13, where Jesus spends 40 days alone with no one by himself in the wilderness across Sabbaths, across days, across everything. And I never thought of it from the Sabbath perspective, and so it really kind of brought some attention to me to at least consider. So Jesus spent a great deal of time using our physical environments to teach us about spiritual ones. In one example, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, alone, on the Sabbath, and not visiting his synagogue or assembly of believers, and being regularly tempted by Satan. To put this into perspective, imagine one of your fellow church members not attending church for four weeks, and when you see them next, they are starving and look like they're about to die. Now, my military background would tell me that you can last roughly a week without water, if that, and about 30 days without food. But yet Jesus went 40 days. So not only would I imagine him coming in about to die, I mean, he probably has moments before death, potentially. But somehow God had nourished him in a different way, as Jesus says, um, and as I, I'll share in a minute through the, what Jesus responds to Satan with, but man does not live on bread alone, but, but the word of God. <clears throat> So, you, but you're, when, after you asked your friend this, you know, where have you gone for 40 days when you look at your friend? Your friend looks over at you and says, before I begin the ministry of my Father in heaven, I needed to spend time in the wilderness to prepare myself for what was to come. Now, footnote, 
you know, as you know, that this, the wilderness was right before he began his ministry. So as soon as that was over, the ministry began for Jesus. <clears throat> Even for Jesus, the first thing he did to prepare for his ministry was to put himself out into the wilderness to pray and learn the lessons needed to prepare him for what God had planned for him next. And I still, ha I still have an interesting question that I, I don't have the answer to. I don't have most answers, honestly. But is that why would Jesus go out to the wilderness and starve himself to death to learn a lesson? You know, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. But, for, but what I can share is um, three sections of what Jesus said to Satan and what that experience like, was like for him in the wilderness. So, I don't know, if you, as, you, as I've studied this, there's really three pieces of temptation that he is tempted with. The first, on the left-hand side, you'll see the, there's a spirit, there is a physical temptation, a spiritual temptation, and a psychological temptation. All three different types of temptations that the devil tempted Jesus while he was out in the wilderness. The first... Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Now, I would also probably describe this as the temptation of power for personal use. Jesus chose not to use his own power, the power that God entrusted him, for the self-benefit of himself. We see that at the cross. Jesus had opportunity to get himself down from the cross, right? All these things that they were shouting at him, you know, if, if you're the son of God, then get yourself out of this. But we already see the answer that he's already given before he even began the ministry in the wilderness, right? The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will, be, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So I would describe this as, this is a spiritual temptation. I'd also describe this as a temptation of pride. Because what Jesus was learning, going through during this wilderness period is, he, was, he already had all the power in the world. But as strong as you feel when you have a backpack, a heavy bag on your back, it does something to your mind. so cute. Uh, um, so the temptation of pride, you know, Jesus has already had everything, but he did have to endure the cross. And just like, good luck, Stacy. <laughs> this is my weekly activity. But there's a pride aspect where Jesus could have it now. Imagine you're young, your teenager, your kids. I want it now. I want it now. Well, there was an opportunity where Jesus was about to get his iPhone, for lack of a better analogy. Right? I want it now. I don't want to wait. Well, Jesus knew he had to wait because not only was he going to get the power over the things that Satan had said, but a much greater power beyond our understanding. So a temptation of pride. How prideful was Jesus? Was it really about himself? Or could he sacrifice his pride for the service of other people? The third is a psychological temptation. <clears throat> the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. 
So you can see how this is a, a psychological test. If, if all the burden and the temptation, I also describe this as a temptation of self-control. When you are starving and when you are hungry and when all of the pain in the world is upon you, I think of Job in this case, right? Job is a great, another great case study. Will you have the self-control to not choose your flesh, but yet to still do the right things? That's pretty, pretty powerful. <clears throat> so another question I began to ask myself after reading this is, how do we learn and teach these same lessons about ourselves and about Jesus? Do I have to go into the wilderness for 40 days to starve myself to learn the same lessons that Jesus is learning here? Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So recently we started a backpacking group and invited church members to join us. When we began this group, I honestly thought we would, get luck we would be lucky to get one to two people who would join us. And I'll give you an example. Every time I usually ask uh, to go on some adventure, it is a struggle to find anyone to go do it. They don't want to go through the physical difficulty of carrying a heavy bag for long periods of time. It's very hard to find people, even for the shortest of distances, because it really does something to your mind. Um, and it's hard. Uh, in fact, years ago, I did the Bataan Memorial Death March, which is 20, the marathon distance, 26 miles in the desert mountains. And it was a timed event, and I had to get through it. And I couldn't get any of my military buddies at all to do with me. They're all like, nope, I'm out, no thanks. So I asked my brother, he was playing for U of A football team at the time, and he's like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And I said, okay, you gotta train. You can't just be pumping iron in the gym. You gotta get out there and you gotta like carry a bag. And uh, during, that, during that period, he didn't do that. He ran like once or twice maybe. And so we get out there and he's like, Michael, this is not the same as working out in the gym. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's a different mindset um, because it's, a long, it's an endurance race. It's not a sprint. That's the difference. So, so I thought seriously we'd only get like one or two people to join us if we got anybody, you know. And after a few weeks, we now have 36 people. 36 people. This is kids and adults that are actually part of and want to be and have communicated they want to be involved in the group. What is also interesting is about 40% of the members don't attend our church, and several have expressed wanting to spend time with other believers that they don't get to do with their current groups. People are wanting to switch from very atheistic type of groups that they're currently backpacking with, because they want to go backpacking with someone, but they would rather do it with, with where we can talk about the Lord and have devotional and really spend time together. So, so here's the lessons that we're trying to learn ourselves and teach during these, these groups. And one of them is how to endure physical difficulty and maintain self-control and composure. Another lesson is how to be prepared and support one another. When you're out there, someone always, something always happens. Somebody's missing some gear, you know, maybe it's toilet paper, <laughs> you know, so you back each other up, right? Maybe somebody's missing water filters, somebody's missing fuel f to make a fire or to cook your food. The thing is you become so much more community-based and dependent on one another. You need each other. You can't go down to Walmart or the 7-Eleven and pick up what you needed. You actually have to call the guy next to you and say, hey, I'm in trouble. I need your help. The third thing is experiencing what it might have been like to travel as Jesus did. Man, when I, in fact, when I was in Africa, it was a re-reminder of truly what it probably was like at time of, of Jesus' time, the hardship, the walking, and I got to re-experience this yet again. I got to experience that in Iraq and Afghanistan some too. <laughs> And it's, it's so mind-blowing whenever you go through these experiences. The fourth thing is what it's like to, to need help to make it another mile mentally. There's a point where you come, it may be at mile two sometimes, cause you, or it may be at mile 20. But at some point in, in your journey, you're going to come to a point where you have to say, can I continue on? Can I continue the journey? Can I take that next step? You know, in our personal lives, is there a struggle in your life where you just can't imagine taking that next step forward? You feel depleted. But what we learn from the wilderness is we learn that you can take that next step. Maybe you need to slow the pace. Maybe you need to offload some of the weight to a friend. But we can do this together. And we can do this with Jesus. So 
we, we've had some really incredible positive feedback too, and I want to share this with you. Some have said, thankful for the investment in our young people and teaching them to endure. And endurance for our young people is hard. Not a lot of them are getting outdoors or spending time in, in situations where it demands physical struggle. My brother has a term called wrestling with it. Have you wrestled with it? Have you wrestled with it? Or are you just taking somebody's word for it? Or are you just going with the flow? Thankful for a chance to give his children an opportunity to see God's creation and test themselves. Another, thankful for an opportunity to spend time outdoors with other believers versus their current group of atheists that they spend time packing with. Because most of these trips span from Friday through Sunday, you can see part of my dilemma here and part of the, this question has come back up for me. And through the group being new, we are learning new ways to keep our time centered on Jesus. One exciting addition is that we're working on, working to create is wilderness devotion guides. One of the things I haven't always done a great job is when we are in the wilderness, we, we have talks, but it's, I've not been a great job at organizing the information in a way we can really stay as centered as we probably should be. It's something I'm trying to grow and do better, and is if when we are unable or we're choosing not to be here among our group, is how do I really keep Jesus the focus of what we're doing? Because if we're not, we're kind of, from what we've read here so far, we're kind of veering away. We're not really centered in on what Jesus has given us for the Sabbath, not spending time with him. And how do, we, how do I do a better job at facilitating those discussions? And so I'm growing in that way myself. So we're excited. We're, we're looking for ways to create these wilderness devotion guides that we can use when we're away, or, or whatever your trip is, whatever you're doing, wherever you are. Um, how can we serve you and support you as members in the church as that you can lead groups wherever you go? With that said, how important is it to keep the church? We've talked a lot about the nuances of Sabbath and activities, but how important is it to keep the church? Now, we all know Paul shares these words for us to consider. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together like some are in the habit of doing, right? Paul seems to say that some have gotten in the habit of not meeting. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10, 25. I love that verse. For a man and I, here are a few things that would not be possible without the church and without you guys in our lives. So four things. One is an opportunity to worship and sing praises with you. We love worshiping and spending time and singing praises with you. Two, a chance to build new relationships with like-minded believers. This has been hard for us, and we have needed the church environment to bring us together. When we, 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 during seasons in which we may not have been as active or we're in transition moving, we feel really alone. And it's so hard. I'm not going to go knocking on every door in my neighborhood and saying, hey, do you know Jesus? Okay, will you be my friend? Right? It's a little awkward. Instead, I, I come up to a church and I say, you know what? I don't really probably have to ask everybody in the room if they know who the Lord is. I'm probably at least in the ballpark. Church really does something for bringing us together and helping us um, grow and serve and be like-minded and to encourage one another in the faith. Without the church body, wherever we are, that makes it almost impossible to do that. The third thing is environments where we are teaching about Jesus are reinforced by other children, parents, and classes. I don't have to worry when I send my kids to a class what they're being taught. At least I hope not. <laughs> um, I get to trust and let my kids go. I don't just trust our kids with just anyone. So that becomes a way I can release our children. And fourthly, an opportunity to serve others and to serve the community together. Men and I believe that we all need to be in church regularly. That's our for, the conviction upon our hearts. And we really hate missing church. But sometimes it's healthy to take a time out and ensure that we are working on our marriage and our family. For us, this has meant getting outdoors. For you, it may be something else. But regardless of what it might be that you need, let us not forget that the Sabbath was made for us as a way of spending time with our Creator and with Jesus, no matter where we are or what we're doing. I hope you will lead your family by example and sit at the feet of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let me pray for us. 
Father God, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, again, taking the sacrifice at the cross. Lord, as we learned this morning, you did not give in to the temptations. You didn't give in to the power, the opportunity that Satan had given you. Lord, instead, you choose to endure, to wait longer, and to take the sacrifice on the cross so not only that you could have power yourself, but you could give all of us an opportunity to live with you. Um, so, Lord, we just thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you that you um, denied the flesh, that you went through the struggle so that we might have your testimony in our blood as we commit and as we believe in you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. God, also we ask wherever we are on this journey, wherever we are in our journey with you, God, that we would be patient and gracious with one another. Lord, I, I know so little, and as I continue to grow, God, I just ask that you would provide me with um, not just the knowledge, but the right attitude and the right heart, Lord, to do your will, regardless of how I feel or what I know. So, Lord, just continue to um, bring us along, Lord, one step at a time as we take the endurance race to coming closer to you and preparing for the kingdom to come. God, we thank you for our uh, time together this morning. God, we want to pray a special blessing on each and every person here who's here today. Lord, that you would lift them up and you would encourage them from health um, to safety, to family, to marriages, to children, to whatever it may be that's on their minds right now. Uh, I pray that you would just uh, encourage them and strengthen them along the way. God, we just uh, thank you for this time. We ask for your blessing as we part and we lift your name up, God. Amen.